Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you for joining me. Uh, today we have another beautiful lesson from coming from the Lord. And our lesson today will be found in Jeremiah. We'll be studying on Jeremiah. Again, hopefully throughout the week you have taken the time to study your lesson, to read these verses, and get a feel of what God is saying to Jeremiah and how he's going to be using him to pronounce to the people what is going to happen to them in the future. Uh, but before we get started, let us again open up in prayer. Can we all bow our heads? Lord, Heavenly Father, God, Heavenly Father, we do say thank you. Thank you, Father, for another blessed day, another opportunity, Father, just to study your word and to show ourselves approved. Father, please lead us and guide us and keep us and help us, Father, to do, Father, the things that you want us to do and be the people that you want us to be. Father, we ask you to bless us, Father, bless our families in this times of trials and tribulations and continue to heal our bodies, our minds, and our souls, Father. These things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. All right. Well, the title for our lesson today is Practice Justice. Practice Justice. Our devotional reading comes from Psalms 86, verses 1 through 13, and our background scripture is found in Jeremiah chapter 21. Our verses that we'll be drawing on and studying today are Jeremiah 21, 8 through 14. All right, hopefully everybody got that. Jeremiah 21, verses 8 through 14. And I'll be using our concordance and also uh, coming from the Bible with some things. And when we close out on this, hopefully everyone will have an understanding on how it applies to us in our lives and how God wants to utilize us to accomplish his goals also. So first, uh, let me uh, just set the stage a little bit and talking about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a very interesting individual and uh, he was one of the prophets the major prophets that uh, prophesied to the people of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom before they went into exile. And in this particular lesson, the people, he's really focusing in on the Southern Kingdom where the people of Judah and uh, Jerusalem were doing all kinds of things and the Lord just really got fed up and said, I'm done with it. And this is what I'm going to do because you are wicked people and you are not doing what uh, the commandments has stressed for you to do and following the laws. But just say a little bit about Jer Jeremiah. Let me read this to you. And so hopefully you'll get a feel of him and who he is. And it reads, what is success? Most definitions include reference to achieving goals and acquiring wealth, prestige, favor, and power. Successful people enjoy the good life, being financially and emotionally secure, being surrounded by admirers and enjoying the fruit of their labors. They are leaders, opinion makers, and trendsetters. Their example is emulated. Their accomplishments are noticed. They know who they are and where they are going, and they strive confidently to meet their goals. By these standards, Jeremiah was a miserable failure. For 40 years, he served as God's spokesman to Judah. But when Jer Jeremiah spoke, nobody listened. Consistently and passionately, he urged them to act, but nobody moved. And he certainly did not attain material success. He was poor and underwent severe deprivation to deliver his prophecies. He was thrown into prison and into a cistern, and he was taken to Egypt against his will. He was rejected by his neighbors, his family, the false priests and prophets, friends, his audience, and the kings. Throughout his life, Jeremiah stood alone, declaring God's message of doom, announcing the new covenant, and weeping over the fate of his beloved country. In the eyes of the world, Jeremiah was not a success. But in God's eyes, Jeremiah was one of the most successful people in all of history. Success as measured by God involves obedience 
and faithfulness. Regardless of opposition and personal cost, Jeremiah courageously and faithfully proclaimed the word of God. He was obedient to his calling. Jeremiah books begin with the call of him as a prophet. And so we'll go to chapter one and we'll see how God called him to do the things that he was to do. In chapter one, it reads, the word of Jeremiah, son of Hikai, one of the priests of Anult in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the ring of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the ring of Jehoiakim, son of Joshua, Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, oh, servant Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child telling us that Jeremiah was a, you know, a young man. He's only considered himself only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I sent you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declare the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see what my word, see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north, I answered. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the people of the northern kingdoms, declared the Lord. These kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgment on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me. That should set the stage for what Jeremiah is about to encounter and have to deal with. Throughout the book, you will find as you read, Jeremiah went and he prophesied to the people. He stood before the people over and over and he told them, thus says the Lord. As you read through the pages, you will see where he was, Jer Jeremiah condemns Judah, you know, for her sins. And he shares with you what will happen there. But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. So the people were worshiping idols and doing doing many different things. The people has went as far as uh, they were worshiping Baal. And one of the things that you done when you worship Baal was to sacrifice your children. So the, the children of God were taking on these practices and doing those things. And the Lord would always speak in the term of them being an adulterous nation and a prostituting themselves, you know, before the but before the gods and taking in the other people and intermarrying and doing all the things that God had shared with them that they should not do. So Joshua, I mean, not Joshua, but uh, Jeremiah continued. And he says here in verse three, if a man divorces his wife and she leaves him to marry another man, should he return to her again? Would not the land be completely defiled? But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers would you now return to me, declare the Lord. These are things that Jeremiah is sharing with the people from the Lord. 
They had unfaithful Israel. He talks to him about them being unfaithful. And he goes on and he says then, how gladly would I treat you like sons and give you a desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me, but like a woman unfaithful to her husband. So you have been unfaithful to me, O house of Israel, declared the Lord. And the Lord continues, you know, to use Jeremiah to continue to prophesy to the people. And then he goes on and he says, I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty and at the heavens and their lights were gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked and there was no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert. So everything that the Lord had placed there, the Lord was taken away. Then he goes on and he talk about no one is upright. Not one is upright. So he couldn't find a good person within the bunch. Not a good person within the bunch. And then I thought, these are only the poor. They are foolish for they do not know the way of the Lord, the requirements of their God. So I will go to the leaders and speak to them. Surely they know the way of the Lord, the requirements of their God. But with one accord, they too had broken off the yoke and torn off the bonds. Jeremiah is speaking directly to him. And he's laying it out there. Then it goes on, Jerusalem was on the seas. He gives the prophecy about Jerusalem there. And he goes on and he, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your soul. If you go the good way, you got to walk in the good way. He talks about false religions and uh, that are worthless. He goes on and talks about sin and the punishment that the people will, 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 will deal with. And throughout it, he's just saying all these things and sharing with the people what thus says the Lord, standing daily before them and sharing these things. And I take it as a, as a people who he was speaking to that was, who, who had not really found themselves because they were lost in the world doing all the things that the Lord did not want them to do. And that's like us today, when you stop and think about it. If someone comes to you constantly and all they're talking to you is negative talk, how bad things are, eventually you're going to want to disassociate yourself with them individuals and move to somebody who's going to say positive things and the uplifting things that you want to hear. And that's really the case with the people of, of uh, Jerusalem and Israel, is they, they didn't want to hear what Jeremiah had to say simply because he was holding them account of all the things wrong that they were doing and presenting to them the outcome and the suffering that they were going to receive by continuing to do those things. And so and then he also he, he accused uh, uh, Judah's leaders. And that's where our lesson for today pick up. But prior to that, this is something that I think is profound on what Josh, Jeremiah says in chapter 20. He says, so the word of the Lord has bought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. So, so Jeremiah is saying that regardless on what I'm going through, regardless on the people not listening, regardless of how I proclaim to them, Lord, <laughs> It seemed like it's useless. It seemed like it's not taking hold. The people aren't listening to me. And, 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 and I don't know if I can go on. But then he goes on to say, but it's, but, but your word, Lord, your word is, is, you know, it's inside of me. It's all in my heart. And it's like a fire that's shut up in my bones. And I got to let it out. I can't stop because remember, the Lord called him personally. The Lord reached out his hand and touched his lip. The Lord put his words into his mouth. And the Lord told him that I'm going to be with you. I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to keep you through this whole ordeal. 
And so he had been doing that and he continued, you know, to do that, you know, with, with the people, speak it out to them. So he, he was just sharing those things. And then he also says, sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. So there is a twinkling of good somewhere in there throughout his message, but they heard so much bad and so much trouble that they were going to be in and they didn't, they didn't want to hear anything. And so, John, so Jeremiah continued, you know, to prophecy and share what the Lord says, which brings us to our lesson today. And our lesson today is in chapter 21. And remember, the title of it is Practice Justice. Practice Justice. And so I'm going to read the verses from it today, and then we will, we will continue from there. All right, and it reads in chapter 21, verses 8 through 14. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stands in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declared the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. Moreover, say to the royal house of Judah, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning, rescued from the hands of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire, because the evil you have done burn with no one to quench it. I am against you, Jerusalem. You who live above this valley on the rocky plain, declares the Lord. You who say, who can come against us? Who can enter this refuge? I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle fire in your forest that will consume everything around you. Powerful words, powerful words. You know, and when you get in that chapter, we started at chapter eight, but in the beginning of that particular chapter, Jeremiah accused Judah's leaders and God reject, rejects Jedekiah's request. See, because Jeremiah had been prophesying and he had shared with them all the things going to happen. And they had saw the northern kingdom fall and the Syrians come in and take the people into captivity. And now Syria had been, uh, been that big power, but they were starting to lose their power. And Babylon had came on the scene with Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar now was taking his place and coming down upon the walls you know, of Jerusalem and the people there. And so, so, Jer so Jeremiah was asked by Zedekiah with this request that he would, uh, you know, go to the Lord on their behalf and ask the Lord if he will protect them and keep them from the harm and everything that's going to come their way. But, and, but Jeremiah answered them, tell Je Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the walls besieging you. And I will gather them inside this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm and anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both men and animals, and they will die of a terrible plague. After that, declares the Lord, I will hand over Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officers, his officials, and the people in this city who survived the plague, sword, and famine to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So he's sharing all these things with them on the wrath that is getting ready to come their way. The Lord said, hey, you done it. You came back out of it now. You can't get away from it. I'm getting ready to, to, to punish you for the things that you have done. And then also, you know, as you continue and you read those, those words where he says, 
Furthermore, tell the people this is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. So the Lord is showing them both the way of life and the way of death. He showed you the way of life and what you should be doing. But because of the things that you're doing, he's showing you the death also. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieged, you will live. They will escape with their lives. And the Lord said, what you need to do, you need to just surrender and go on into captivity. Just let them take you because this is where it's going to happen. But if you stay and fight and you put up a fight against them and you want to be, be that type of individual, then you surely are going to die. I have determined to do this city harm and not good. Lord, so I'm going to do it harm. Harm is coming upon you. There's no more good that's going to be here. It's going to be desolate. It's going to be like a desert, you know, after all this is taking place. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, which is Nebuchadnezzar, and he will destroy it with fire. So after all the people are gone, after he had ravished it and taken all the wealth from the city, everything that they were using, you know, before the Lord, then he's going to set the city to the to fire. And then it goes on. Moreover, says the royal house of Judah, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning. Rescue from the hands of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire. So in other words, all the things that you are doing wrong right now, you need to clean them up. You need to start doing the things that the Lord wants you to do instead of robbing the people and being running havoc upon the people on a regular basis. And then he goes on, because of the evil you have done, burn with no one to quench it. So no one's going to be able to stop anything that Nebuchadnezzar will be doing as he captures the city and takes in the people. I am against you, Jerusalem. You will live above the, you who live above this valley and on the rocky plateau, declares the Lord. The Lord says, I am against you. So, you know, no other thing could be worse than to have God himself against you. And the wrath is going to come down upon you if God himself is against you. And then he goes on, you who say, who can come against us? Who can enter our refuge? Simply because they set up on a hill and they had the wall around the city and the way the people was living. Can't nobody get to us. And plus, we got God protecting us and keeping us because they had knew the history. They knew how God had saved them and how God had bought them, you know, out of Egypt and how God had, 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 had given them the promised land, you know, flowing with milk and honey and how God had set them up with all the things and all the pleasures that he had given them. And then they still chose not to worship him and to live according to his teaching. And so now I said, so who can come against us? But the Lord said, I'm coming against you. I'm the one who's going to come against you. And I'm sending Babylon in because they are the people that I have chosen to take you captive and take you into bondage. I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. Because of your wickedness, because of your evil ways, I am going to punish you. I will kindle a fire in your forest that will consume everything around you. So everything is going to be destroyed and the people are going to be taken into captivity. So, you know, Jeremiah is sharing this with the people. He's telling them all of these things. They didn't want to hear all these things. But the Lord continue to utilize him. He continued to preach that word. He continued to prophesize to the people because everything that he was saying and sharing with the people was coming directly from the Lord. See, so you, you may wonder, okay, now, I, you know, I understand all that. I see what was happening with the people and I understand, you know, what the Lord did and how he used it his wrath upon him. But how what, what what has this got to do with me and us today simply because life is different from us? Well I'm glad you are you know thinking about that on how this lesson pertains to us and what we need to be looking at. See so in Deuteronomy ten chapter twelve through twenty one there's some things that you should be looking at. But what I want to share with you, I want to start off by asking you a question. Have you ever seriously asked yourself what does God ask of me? Like he had asked of the people of Israel, he had asked for his children, but what has he asked of me? 
Although we know we are not under the law, but under grace, the fact that we are under grace does not free us from the law. Matthew 5 and 17 tells us, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. See, so as we are renounced, are we to renounce the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount or the law, the, the law of love in 1 Corinthians 13, because we are not under law, but under grace? I dare to say no. Our great need today is to recognize as Christians the authority and reverence of God's law for our day, for us right now here and what we should be doing so that things won't come down upon us because of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God does not desire certain things of his children, but he requires them. What does the Lord ask of you? Ask yourself that question. Always remember that whatever God requires or asks of us is always for our good. On what grounds does he make his commands? Who is he that he should require certain things of us? Because he is why? Because he is the one who seeks to conform us to his requirements simply because, one, God is revealed as the creator and processor of heaven and the earth. It is as my creator that he comes and makes certain requirements of me. Because he is my creator, he can make requirements of me. Two, God is revealed as the one who has chosen us for himself. This is a humbling truth and is gathered up in that great New Testament verse of Ephesians 2 and 10. It is the one who has chosen me for himself, who comes and makes certain demands of me. Number three, God is revealed as the sovereign Lord. He not only made us, but is the one who exercises authority over us. And it is his right to require that we do certain things. Number four, God is revealed as the universal provider. How reasonable it is, therefore, that having provided all of us, he requires certain things of us. Five. God is revealed as our redeemer. He redeemed the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. But we have been redeemed through the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the bondage of sin and the devil. That's good news. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 tells us, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and defect, nor defect. What then are God's demands? <coughs> One. To fear the Lord, your God. These are God's demands of us. One, to fear the Lord, your God. This is not a cardinal film, fear. We are not slaves. We are sons and daughters of Christ. Second Timothy 1 and 7 tells us, For God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and of a sound mind. God has given us this. To fear the Lord means to trust him, to act upon his word and to fear to displease him. So we should be wanting to do right because I don't want to displease God in any way. That's the fear that I have. I don't want to do wrong. I don't want God to see their fault. I want to do right and live according to his words. 
So the question is, do we fear God like this? Do you feel him, fear him that way? And number two, to walk in all his ways. We need to walk in all of God's ways. By nature, we go our own way. And we all like to get our own way and go our own way. But here is the question. Have you ever given up your own will to God's way? Huh. Have you ever given up your own will to God's way? In other words, have you put self aside and accepted God in and live according to his teaching and guidance? God's way is always the best. Why? Psalms 18 and 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust him. So in other words, if I trust him and I follow his ways, he's going to be that buckler. He's going to be that foundation. He's going to guide me and keep me and show me to live accordingly. Psalms 18 and 30. As the Lord God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust him. We must come to the point where we desire God's way with all of our heart. Number three, we are to love him. God does not require simply that we love his, his service, his house, or his truth. The question he put to Peter was this. Do you truly love me? Proverbs 6, 16, 19. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hungs that shed innocent blood, a heart with that div divisive wicked imaginations, feet that are swift and run into mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and to who soweth discord among brethren. What does the Lord ask of you but to love him? Number four, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The whole thought here is to undividedly loyalty. And of course, the primary service that he requires is indicated in Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Have you ever really given your body voluntarily and completely to the Lord? Have you systematically yield all of you to him? Number five is to observe the Lord's commandments. This seems to gather all, up all that God is saying into one simple statement. Deuteronomy 10 and 13 says, And to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. This should be our main desire, our primary concern, our burning passion to observe the Lord's command for they that are always for our good. The Lord's words are for our good. His commands are for our good. Remember that if we keep them, we must know that these commands are, we must immerse ourselves deeply into the word. We must love the Bible, read it, study it, meditate in his truth and teaching that it may never be said of us what Jesus said of people many years ago. Matthew 22 and 29, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. That's our lesson for today. Practice justice. We have to live accordingly and live to God's command so that we will receive the benefits that he is setting forth for each and every one of us. God is good. God is awesome. God is magnificent. And our lesson for next week will be repent of justice, repent of injustice, 
Devotional reading will be Psalm 72, 1 through 17. The background scripture is Jeremiah 22. Read it. Get an understanding of it. And let's come together again next Sunday and get dive into it because God has another message for us within it. Blessing and thank you, God. Let us uh, bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for the lesson. Help us, Father, to live up to your commands, Father. Help us, Father, to Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus help Christ. Help us, Father, to, to just do what you want us to do, Father. We're asking you and we're calling upon you daily. Father, these things we pray in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. May God bless and may God keep you. Thank you.